welcome to day two of the of the conference actually day three we had our pre-conference workshops on monday and our second day of presentations today so we'll just give it a minute more i don't know Auntie, if there's anything from your side any housekeeping that you want to do um, at the start of the the day um not anything from my side antoinette except for thank you to to you antoinette for agreeing to facilitate the session um, you will do the necessary introductions and welcome, and then we will have the great opportunity to listen to our keynote speaker, Professor David Bard, and thereafter there will be a Q&A session. So over to you and many thanks, Antoinette, and to you, Professor Bard. Thank you very much uh, for that, Anthea. And yes, colleagues, it's now one minute past nine. So I think let's get started. Again, a warm word of welcome to um, the second day of conference presentations and a warm word of welcome to our keynote speaker here today, Professor David Bout, who I'll introduce um, shortly. But while I have the floor, um, I would really want to encourage all of you to stick with us today up to the closing panel. Um, which will be facilitating myself and my division, be facilitating right at the end of the conference, and then also the prize giving. And I also would like you to watch out for the delegate pre presentations and please vote for any uh, of the presentations because, of course, there will also be a delegate's um, prize. And then also please vote for your favourite PREDAC post if you haven't done so already, because of course there'll also be a prize for the best PREDAC post. So please get voting and your voice matters in, also in terms of those um, presentations. So then colleagues, uh, after I've welcomed you as delegates, it's my huge privilege and honour to welcome our keynote speaker this morning, Professor David Bowd. I, uh, I think there's a feedback, so there might be a microphone open somewhere. There we go. Thank you very much for switching off that microphone. So Prof Baud is the Alfred Deakin Professor and Foundation Director of the Centre for Research and Assessment and Digital Learning at Deakin University in Melbourne. He's also Emeritus Professor at the University of Technology of, in Sydney. He has previously held a number of positions, some of them Head of School of Adult and Language Education, Associate Dean and Dean of the University Graduate School at UTS. He has published extensively on teaching, learning and assessment in higher and professional education. His current work focuses on the areas of assessment for learning in higher education, academic formation and workplace learning. He is one of the most highly cited scholars internationally in the field of higher education with an H index of 90. He has been a pioneer in developing learning centered approaches to assessment across the disciplines, particularly in building assessment skills for long term learning. And I'm just going to refer to some of the books that he's published, Developing Evaluative Judgment in Higher Education, Rutledge 2018. And then also in terms of designing new approaches to feedback uh, Two of the books he's published there, Feedback in Higher and Professional Education, Rutledge 2013, and The Impact of Feedback in Higher Education, Improving Assessment Outcomes for Learners, uh, Powergrave Macmillan 2020, as well as the implications, of course, important for us in COVID-19, the digital for assessment, and in this case, a more recent publication, Reimagining University Assessment in a Digital World, Springer 2020. So we are really honoured to have you here today, um, Professor Baud, to talk to us about developing students' evaluative judgment, how can assessment and feedback contribute? I'm not going to read your whole abstract. Um, I am sure that you're going to elaborate on it. And while I see the hand clapping coming through colleagues, I really want to encourage you through the chat while Professor Baud is speaking to post your questions while they're coming up. And of course, uh, we'll have some time at the end of his presentation for him to react to some of those questions, but it would really help if you do it um, while he is talking already and while it comes up. Over to you, Professor Bard. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Antoinette, and uh, greetings from Sydney, Australia. I'm uh, very pleased to be invited to contribute to your conference today. And 
reflecting on your theme, yes, assessment matters. Now, we normally think of assessment in terms of marking or grading students' work, but I think it's much more than this. It influences students' learning now. It influences their path through their course. It influences their access to future career careers. And importantly, it influences how they see themselves and how they see the work they do. It really influences their formation, whatever else we do. Now, unfortunately, our discussion, our discourse about assessment in universities is incredibly impoverished. Far too much attention is focused on grades that are awarded at much too fine a level of accuracy that can possibly be justified. We, we treat them as if they're some, some sort of magical number. Today, I want to move way beyond such discussions to what I think is fundamental in student assessment, the capacity of students to judge themselves and judge for themselves. And before we start on the main presentation, I'd like to pose a question to you. And I'd like to think you to think about this. I'm not going to ask for your response, but it's a way of orienting ourselves to the issue. Let's just imagine you've got some new task. It might be an academic task. It might be something outside completely. So confronted with a new task that you haven't done before, how do you know if you're doing it well or not? What makes you come to the conclusion, yes, I'm doing this well, or no, I'm not doing it well? Very, very rarely will somebody give you a test to test you on whether you've done that task well or not. So it's really down to us to make that decision. So have a think about that. What is it that you take into account? Now, I have an answer I prepared earlier. Um, these are some of the things that we might do. So how do we know if we're working well on a task? So we look for good examples of good work on other on similar tasks. So has someone done this before. Can I look at one? Can I see one? Um, we might ask our peers or our co-workers, you know, what do you think about that? You know, is, am I getting there? Is this kind of just about right? We might identify the basis on which we'll be judged. Are there some protocol? Are there some contracts? Are there some specifications that give us a clue about whether this thing we're doing is good or not? And we might even show samples of our thinking to other people and get their comments or their feedback about that. We might do things like consult documentation. We might ask experts. And I leave this one last. We might not ask our line manager. Um, it's very interesting. Um, the research evidence suggests that the person that we are least likely to reveal our learning needs to is our boss. And there's all sorts of structural and positional reasons for that. And that raises an interesting question. If the last person we're going to reveal this information to in the workplace is our boss, what does that say about students? Are they going to reveal their real learning needs to you? Are they going to reveal their real judgments to you? Well, let's just leave that one hanging for the moment and go into the main presentation. So I want to position this idea of developing um, student evaluative judgment within the whole area of assessment. How does it kind of lock in to other ideas we have about assessment? I then want to move on to the idea of what it is. And I want to look at the components, what are the elements of it? I want to look at how we design this development into our courses in normal ways. This is not a bolt on. This is not an add on. This is the way we do our normal business, because at the end of the day. We don't just want our students to graduate with a certain amount of knowledge. We want them to know what they know and know what they can do and know what they don't know and know what they can't do. And then I want to end up with some examples in practice in university courses so you can see the kind of things that uh, that we might do. OK, so let's start with the idea of assessment. Now, this really maps the three key purposes of assessment. Now, a couple of those are very familiar to you, probably. The first one is to assure that learning outcomes have been met. This is the thing that we do all the time. Now, we might not necessarily do it in terms of learning outcomes, but we do do summative assessment that basically says 
have the students completed this course or this course unit or this module to the satisfactory to the level that is needed. And that sometimes that has marks and grades, sometimes it doesn't. By, by and large, it does have marks and grades. So that's what we've traditionally called summative assessment. That is assessment at the end of a period of study on completion of that period of study. Have you got it or not? Or have you got it to a certain level or not? That's the first purpose. The second purpose, again, is one you'll be very familiar with, is to enable students to use information to aid their learning now. So this is the kind of assessment we do along the way. It's formative. It helps students form their learning. It happens during the course. Typically, we have words like feedback attached to it. This is information that students get and the processes they follow through on that gives them information about how well are they tracking? Are they tracking in the right direction? Are they going to ultimately be able to end up meeting the learning outcomes in a summative way? And we provide them with information in all sorts of different ways. And finally, the third main purpose of assessment is to build students capacity to judge their own learning. It's just not good enough for our graduates to go out knowing stuff. They need to know the limits of their knowledge and understanding. Because without that, they can't do any useful work. They're not safe practitioners of anything. They're not confident practitioners of anything. And this is not a process. It's not a process that ends, uh, that somehow occurs at, on the point of graduation. Before the point of graduation, they don't have this capacity. We send them out there with a degree and they have this capacity to make judgments. Well, it's not like that. They're only going to build that capacity if we are doing it all the way through. And if our other acts of assessment are contributing to that. So for the rest of my presentation, I'm not going to look at the first two purposes of assessment. I'm going to look exclusively at this third purpose. So it involves looking at assessment as if we are really serious about learning. If we are really serious about learning, we'd focus on what students need to be able to do in order to learn. And in order to be able to learn, students need an appreciation of what they can do and where they can go. And they do need to be able to monitor themselves because unless they have that appreciation, they don't know what to do next. And there's only a limited number of occasions on which we can tell them what to do next. By and large, for most of the time, they're at their own devices. So if they don't know what they know and can do, how can they take the next step? And this is the next step both during the course and outside in the workplace. It's just the same in those two, two environments. The only difference is within the university, we can actually provide structures and scaffolding to help them develop these judgmental skills out in the workplace they've got to build those for themselves so this takes us to the idea of evaluative judgment and i've already kind of rehearsed this the first part of it anyway if students can't judge the quality of their work how can they learn if graduates can't judge the quality of their work how can they practice but also and this is the third leg if they can't help each other judge the quality of each other's work, how can they work together? So it's not just something about individual learning, it's about learning together with other people. So some of you may be scratching your head thinking, hang on, this, there's, there's something kind of vaguely familiar about this. We've heard about these ideas before. And in one sense, yes, in one sense, this is a repositioning of a whole lot of other ideas that have been out there for a long period of time. And the main one that you'll probably think of, is it the same self-assessment? In one sense it is, in one sense it isn't. We deliberately not use the term self-assessment because it's got, it's got a bad rap. It's associated with a whole lot of things that we think are inappropriate. So self-assessment, if you look at the literature, it's emphasised the moment of judgment, not why self-assessment is needed. 
And the one thing we know is that one off self assessment activities don't develop students judgmental capacity. The other thing that evaluative judgment does is it focuses attention on what the capability is, or is that graduates need. And it also positions assessment as a whole as an act to inform learners judgment. So yes, we are making judgments about them. And for one purpose, there's some accreditation, there's some documentation, there's some certificate they get. But if that's all that happens, we're setting them short. We also need assessment to help build the capability for them to form their own judgments. So at the point of graduation, they should be completely unsurprised about um, the standard of degree that they get. If they're surprised, we have failed them or they've uh, fooled themselves. So is self and peer assessment enough? Um, not when it's misused and misunderstood, um, as I mentioned. This is not about students grading themselves on each other. But it's about students identifying appropriate criteria and applying them to their work. And I'll unpack that in a minute. We also need to be very careful that we don't inadvertently give students incentives to distort their judgments. So we, by and large, we can't use self and peer assessment marks for anything useful because built into those, there's an incentive for students to not be honest with themselves. So one of the things that we often have to do in the area of evaluative judgment is to kind of move away from marks because Mark can lead students down the wrong track and give them some perverse incentives for fooling themselves. And of course, there's a much bigger issue at stake than marking or grading. And the bigger issue is, can, can they judge their work for themselves? <clears throat> now, um, a few years ago, we organised a big international symposium in Melbourne um, and we brought a whole lot of people together around this theme of developing evaluative judgment. And we had to come up with a definition. And this is the definition that we, we, we used. The capability to make informed decisions about the quality of one's work, one's own work and that of others. Um, we would have slightly reworded it to make it a little more elegant um, in retrospect, but that's that's what it says. So it's about judging work of oneself and of others. And you say, well, don't we do it already um, implicitly? Well, yes, it's implicit, but not often explicit or systematic. It gets very distracted by the fragmentation of the curriculum. Students move from different modules, different course units to other course units. The level of coordination, the level of integration between them is much, much less than we think it is. Students don't experience that as a very strong feature of courses the way in which they are all joined up. So what happens in one unit doesn't get transferred into other units. And of course, many of our conventional assessment practices displace or inhibit it. So if students always look to us to judge them. They won't be in a good position to develop their own capacity to judge for themselves. So let's look at some of the um, key features. So, oh, there's a missing word here. <laughs> An understanding of what constitutes quality, it should say. Uh, quality is the missing word. So, unless students know what quality looks like, how can they possibly produce work that represents quality? So, we need to think about that quite carefully. So, have students been in a position to make that understanding, to see sufficient examples of quality work of the kind they're trying to achieve. There's also a recognition of a standard, whether that standard is implicit or explicit, whether it's individual or community. So we need an understanding of a standard, a yardstick by which we can judge work. We also need a desire or opportunity or habit to be developed by learners 
to make judgments that are contextually, socially and culturally apt. Now, the judgment a student might make in the first year of their first course is going to be completely different from the kind of much more sophisticated judgments we expect them to make in final year before they graduate. And what they do within the context of university course is going to be different from the kind of judgments they make in a community setting, even with regard to the same subject matter. So the evaluative judgment is contextual. They also need to be able to articulate and justify their judgments. It's no good them saying, well, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can do this or I know that. Unless they can explain why it is they've come to that view and justify what they can do, then they probably haven't got it enough. Unless they can explain it to someone else, have they really achieved that level of expertise? And of course, they might go further in their development of expertise in which it becomes automatic. So we are continually finding new and more sophisticated things to apply evaluative judgment to, and we're making more and more uh, sophisticated judgments. Evaluative judgment isn't something that stops. It is something that right through our career, right through our lives, we develop. And we just get better at it or we get stuck and we don't progress. And of course, the evaluative judgment develops over time and it develops in particular domains. Just because you're, you can make that judgment very well in first year physics, it doesn't mean to say you can apply the same kind of evaluative judgment skills to write in essays in history. You know, there's a bit of, uh, you know, commonality, but not that much. So one of the things we th have to think about in terms of examples is how do we contextualise them within the discipline or the professional domain? So these are seen to be the two fundamental legs of um, evaluative judgment. The first one being understanding notions of quality. What does quality look like? What represents quality? What are the characteristics of quality? How do you unpack it? How do you explain it? How can you identify another example which is completely different but also represents quality? There's that. And there's also making comparisons with the work that one is creating for oneself. And how does that stack up with these notions of quality? How do they go together? And some of the things that we can do around this, um, I'm just going to pop up on the diagram. Now, I'm going to be talking about these in a bit more detail as we go along. Um, but to understand quality, we need to get feedback on our, our notions of quality. We need to engage with models. We need to discuss standards. We need to discuss criteria. It's absolutely no good writing these down. I don't know what it's like, what it's like in South Africa, but in Australia, we have rubrics for everything. And rubrics are supposed to communicate to students what the standards are, what the criteria are that will apply to the work that they're doing. And the problem with a rubric is you can only understand what it represents and you can only understand what quality is if you've already successfully completed that course. And you can probably only appreciate the rubric if you're the teacher rather than the student. So we need not to assume that we can just you know, explain, simply give a handout or whatever. We do need students to engage with and understand and have dialogue about these things. And on the comparison side, we can do things like, well, students can try assessing others against a uh, criteria or against a rubric. One of the good ways of developing that capacity to judge oneself is to not start with oneself, but to get some critical distance on one's own performance by making judgments of another's. Giving feedback information to others, evaluating one's own performance. And one of the most useful things of all is to have students develop sets of rubrics or criteria. And I'll be giving some examples of that later. So these are the two key elements. So how do we actually introduce those into courses without displacing all the good things that courses do at the moment? 
there's really two key places we can put it in. We can include these ideas in teaching and learning activities, nothing to do with assessment, just within their teaching and learning interactions and tasks that students do. Or we can associate them with assessment tasks, whether they're summative assessment tasks or formative tasks. So these are the two places they can sit. The things where it doesn't work, and we know this so much already, it's things we don't know, but we know these things already. Just having some simple intervention within an individual course unit isn't very effective. Also, it's not very effective is students actually making judgments like, um, you know, working out what you know grade they might get without feedback on the criteria they're using, the um, whether what whether their judgments are justified by the work they've produced, and so on and so forth. So they need feedback needs to be built into this. We mustn't assume that it easily transfers from one knowledge domain to another, as I've mentioned. So we can't say, well, we've done it in first year X, it will apply to second year Y. And the other thing that we shouldn't wait is wait for is for students to know more, to become more advanced, more mature, and so on and so forth. We need to start right from day one. In fact, we need to start in um, high school. No, no, we need to start in primary school. No, we need to start in kindergarten. Often some of the things that, 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 that kids do in the very early years are actually much better at promoting their evaluative judgment than what we do in higher education. So here's some of the practices that can help. Um, of course, it's all to do with the way you put them together. So consistently using and assessing learning outcomes. Now, I deliberately with my students never talk about marks and grades. Unless I'm absolutely painted into a corner and I can't escape. This is not a normal part of my discourse. I always talk with my students about have they or have they not met certain learning outcomes? How well have they met them? How can they meet them more effectively? How can they address them, the ones that they haven't met so far? So we need the discourse of learning outcomes as fundamental in our talk and not the discourse of marks and grades. Of course, we need a, um, a standards based assessment regime. Now, again, I don't know exactly how far down the track you are at Stellenbosch, but right through the world, right through all the OECD countries, there's a huge move towards making assessment standards based. And that means we do not, under any circumstances, judge students against each other. We judge students against standards and criteria. Because if we judge them against each other, you get a different cohort of students in a different mix of students. Standards change. Now, standards may well change over time for good reason, but they shouldn't change because you've got a different bunch of students taking the course. Curricular mapping is very useful here to see how we are developing various skills over time. Embedding evaluative activities within normal tasks and assessments, and this is where I'm going to say a lot more about that with the examples. And we need mechanisms for learners tracking their attainment of outcomes throughout the program. And again, I'll say more about that with an example. OK, other pedagogical, pedagogical practices, and I'm just going to, this is really a list here, and I, I think I'll probably uh, save my time for the uh, uh, examples. Um, I think I'm going to mention most of those in the examples. So I won't linger on that slide. So. Number of things I want to mention, first of all, the importance of everyday discussion. There are things that we do in our lectures and our tutorials and our labs which help students develop this as a normal part of how we talk about. The subject matter that we're studying. Peer review activities have been found to be very, very powerful. Um, in undergraduate courses and 
of course, peer review means a multitude of different sins. Uh, and I want to spell out what I mean by peer review with undergraduates um, as we go through. Um, I want to look at not the changing of assignments themselves, but the activities that go around assignments. We can make an assignment much, much more powerful in terms of developing students' judgments if we look at how we lead up to that and how we lead out of that. And also I want to mention the importance of uh, doing things across the curriculum, not in just one little subject. So, of course, students develop their judgment all the time through everything they do. So we need to think about this and we can we need to think in terms of are we helping this or are we helping uh, it? Are we making it more difficult for students? So the conversations they have with us, how do we talk about those? Do we talk about them in terms of what are the standards they've got to reach? What are the outcomes they're trying to achieve? How well are they tracking with those? They do the same thing in conversations with their peers. One of my PhD students is actually doing a whole lot of in-depth analysis with students in their first and second year physics classes and the activities they do between the classes to see how they develop evaluative judgment when they're away from staff, when they're away from the normal curriculum. What do students seek out to look at? What do we encourage students to seek out to look at? What examples do they find? Do we know what kind of examples they find? Do we help them deal with the examples they find? And how do they check their own understanding of anything? All these are parts of normal business in normal teaching and learning interactions. This is absolutely nothing new except we're thinking about it with an, a slightly different lens. Not a completely different lens, a slightly different lens. And is what they're doing, is this all occurring well? How do they know? How do we know? So this is all about legitimising um, discussion of judgment as a normal part of teaching and learning conversations. Now, let me give you an example. This is as basic as it gets, and this is an example that Graham Gibbs came up with in the 1970s. Right, This is not new. This has been around for a long time, and people have been using it for a long time. Simple exercise in first year classes. It doesn't matter how big the class is, so long as students can actually turn to each other in smaller groups within a bigger room. So when do we do this? We do this before students work start work on their next assignment. And Graham used it with then very first assignment. Not, not, no, so they knew very little. They were doing this about a third of the way in to their first unit in the first year. So he breaks them into groups of three or four or four or five. And he gives them three examples of the next assignment that they will do, completed examples. Three examples of what students in a previous year have done and have given permission to be shared. And of course, you set it up in such a way that one of these is a, a really good example, a really good assignment. One of them is in the middle somewhere and the other one is just maybe staggering over the line. And they're asked to individually read these and then as a group identify for themselves as a group and agree as a group what distinguishes them. How does A differ from B that differs from C? And students can pretty easily say, well, this is better than that, which is better than that. Now, that's the easy bit. Then you press them. What specifically, what features in A or B or C mean that you say this is better than that? This is better than that. Spell them out. Write them down. Identify exactly what makes this better than another. And then ask them to list the factors they're using to make their judgments. And what you've been doing without using the word criteria, you might then introduce the word criteria, you've been asking them to identify 
criteria of quality. They are going through an exercise in which they distinguish and discern what makes an assignment a quality assignment. And you will find that students can do this. They can do this as a group. Very difficult for them to do it individually. Individually, some of them will get in, some of them won't. But if you've got a group, mixed group, then mostly the factors will come out. So this is an example of students identifying quality through looking at standards and criteria. But you lead them into it through a really, really grounded example. Students love this example because they then got a very clear idea of what they need to do in their own assignment. Now, their own assignment is going to be a different topic. It's not going to be the same topic as the ones that they've been looking at. So they can't use it directly as a model. But what they can use is they can use the thinking, the ways of thinking, the ways of deconstructing what is good and applying them to their own work. Example one, another example with feedback. Now, of course, feedback is a process and not an input. The common error that we make is we talk about feedback as, as if it is the comments that staff make about students' work. This is wrong. The last five years has completely overturned this idea. Feedback is what students do in response to inputs they get from other people. So feedback is a student process which might be stimulated by a staff process, but it's the whole business that leads to improved learning. So in this case, students identify the kind of comments they want on their submission. So they've got uh, something they hand in and on the cover sheet, I assume you use cover sheets with their you know, information on it. They say, well, I would particularly like you to make comments about X and Y. Now you need to um, help them <laughs> uh, um, uh, make that transition because they might find that a very, very strange thing to do at first. They might just say, well, whatever comments you'd like to give me. And you say, well, that's not acceptable. Unless you give me some spe specific thoughts about what you need, then you're not going to get anything useful out of it. So what we're already doing is that we're preloading students to think about quality and how well they're doing and what they need input on to help them calibrate their own judgments. So they produce the work they hand it in, they get comments on that work, and then we expect them to write some action plans when they receive their comments. And what we do when we make these comments on their work is that we're commenting on their judgments and not the substantive content. Now, I'll spell this out a bit more in one of the uh, a more elaborate example. Rubrics, this is an example of co-constructing a rubric, and I'm going to move on quickly after that because of time. Examples of self-assessment, these slides will be available. Example of peer feedback. Um, the one thing that I think is a really powerful thing is peer review. I've had a PhD student who's just um, submitted this year and he's looked at all the things that go on in first year classes that help the development of evaluative judgment and he was looking at evaluative judgment as students write academic writing and the thing that he found most powerful and the most common coming up in the um, examples he looked at was structured peer review students making comments about each other's work through various processes and these uh, here, which you can read in detail later, are examples of peer review activities. I'm going to move on from this because of timing. So we also need to work across the whole curriculum. So, for example, one of the studies that I've undertaken, or a couple of studies with um, Lawson and Thompson, is that we looked at every single assessment item in every subject throughout the whole degree program, but not just every item, but every criterion for every item. So what we got students to do was to rate themselves, rate their performance with regard to each criterion for each standard, that is each learning outcome 
for everything that they produced in their whole three year degree course. And what we found, not surprisingly, but this, this is empirical evidence, is that they got better about making judgments by making judgments. And they got better by making judgments through getting comments from other people, staff members normally, about how they can make better judgments. That's that's the this is the thing that we um, um, used the, the the platform we used to do it through. Um, although we used um, a digital platform, these were all face to face students. OK, so evaluative judgment doesn't develop uniformly. It's never complete and it's often contestable. That's good. We can have a discussion about it. We can we can not just talk about how we make it better, but you know, can we refine it in various ways? So it involves the coming together of elements beyond the student. It requires them to exert their own agency, no matter how unsupportive the context. It can be helped by the design of courses and what we do. It can be helped by the activities we include and the interventions we make. So the issue is not do we do a whole lot of new stuff, but how do we make our existing interventions much more potent? in terms of helping students develop their judgments and so help them develop their learning. And importantly, most of all, it depends on creating a context in which students see the making of judgments for themselves and with their peers as absolutely central. This is not some weird idea, some innovative idea that you stick on. This is what we normally do. And in the literature about feedback, in the literature that's emerging about evaluative judgment, what we're seeing is that it becomes acceptable when it is really, really fully integrated into the subject matter. Um, we've got a little one page guide. If you only want one page to read about evaluative judgment, uh, there's this. And of course, um, there's a whole lot of references that you can use to follow up. So I will pause there and look forward to uh, hearing your questions. Thank you very much for that, David. That was brilliant. Um, and there were some questions and comments coming in. And thanks. I see all the clapping as well. I wish we could have given you a real clap <laughs> that you could hear the sound. But I'm sure you're hearing it virtually and seeing all the emoticons coming up. Um, there were many comments coming in as you were talking. Um, and I will just alert you to some of the specific questions. So first of all, there was great appreciation for the work that and how influential you've been at Stellenbosch University in influencing many of our thoughts as well. There were issues of uh, mentions of Bart and Malloy, also your work with, with Angela Brew. Um, and then, of course, it moved while you were moving through sustainable assessment. Uh, there were also comments. We had a very good keynote panel yesterday, and many of the issues you raised ca actually came up in questions in the keynote um, panel as well. And I think you answered with your whole um, emphasis on sustainable assessment and developing evaluative judgment. You actually answered many of those questions or alluded to potential answers to many of the questions that were asked. Maybe coming to some specific questions, I think there was one from Deborah in terms of how does one do this, this assessment as a conversation in a class of 380 students? Because I think um, our new assessment policy at Stellenbosch University does have that as a central idea, assessment as a conversation. But I think, first of all, how do you do it in a class of 380 students? And second of all, uh, the second question from Debbie is, please could you expand on how lecturers can calibrate the student's self-assessment, what they believe is correct or, inc or important. So I think both the big classes issue, but then also expanding on how lecturers can calibrate the student's self-assessment, what they believe is correct or important. Yeah, um, taking that um, big classes first, um, I think it's, it's, it's always an issue, but on the other hand, um, I'm since I've been at Deakin, and we do have large classes at Deakin. When we talk about a large class at Deakin, we're talking about a thousand plus. We're not talking about a few hundred. Um, so um, I've been doing a lot of work on how you do feedback uh, at scale. And basically, um, you can do it just as easily as you can with a small group, 
but you can't do it all yourself. You actually have to kind of mobilise a whole lot of other people to do it with you and to mobilise students to do it effectively. Now, the one thing that we got to give up here is we can never give enough feedback ourselves. We can never provide enough advice ourselves. So we've got to structure our classes in such a way that students are doing it for each other. We need to help develop resources. So that peer review is a, is a, is a very good example of an idea in which we can um, introduce students to um, various ways of working with each other. Now, I was really surprised when Abbas, uh, my student, he found these normal classes using these approaches. So they weren't doing it in order to demonstrate a value of judgment. They were doing it because it was a good thing to do in their subject matter. So this was um, he was looking particularly at the arts and humanities faculty, social science, arts and humanities. Um, but I'm sure you could find equivalent things in other faculties. So how do you set things up? How do you actually use um, the digital environment? Digital environment is very important for sharing information for students working in groups. Um, I don't know what it's like with you, but we can't easily get all our students, even in normal circumstances, even low COVID, getting them all together in one place at one time. So actually setting up activities where you've got to be co-located is a bit, a bit of a challenge. So we've got to use the digital technology and we've got to use um, just well-designed activities. Um, I think that's that's a simple way. Um, to give some examples, and this is not examples of evaluative judgment, but you can read evaluative judgment in them. We did a very big national project a few years ago, and the URL is called assessmentforlearning.org. Assessmentforlearning.org. And we have got nine, is it nine case studies, seven or nine case studies there in depth of how you do feedback and how you do feedback at scale. So we've got at least three examples there of classes of over a thousand students doing really high quality feedback, really high quality feedback. And I, I, having been through this project and seen what my colleagues have done, I, 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 there's, there's, no, there's no excuse. You just have to be kind of mindful and use the resources that you have available. Um, the second one was about, remind me what the second part of the question was, scale and what's the other? I can, uh, this is Debbie here, so I can, <laughs> sorry, Antoinette. Um, my question there is um, that we have, um, we have done peer assessment um, and my colleague Craig McGregor has also done peer assessment of written reports. And one of the, one of the um, somewhat shocking um, things to see is what students think is good and what they think is correct. And so what is a, a, an easy way or I don't know easy, but what is a recommended way to bring in some sort of calibration to 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 monitor what they are doing in the peer assessment to make sure that they're not misguiding each other? Yeah, yeah. And th this issue about students fooling each other and, and fooling themselves is a big issue. So, I mean, one of the papers on that, that, that list is about threats to students' evaluative judgment and how we stop students and indeed ourselves falling on ourselves about the quality of our work. One, one, of the, um, one of the really useful ideas, both in feedback and in evaluative judgment, is the idea of the, the nested task. So you really have one task that's, that's broken down into various stages. And some of those stages have um, individual activities. Some of those stages have peer review. And some of those stages end up in, in a summative uh, submission. So what it means is that we need students to get practice in making judgments. And a part of practice in making judgments is making bad judgments. OK, so we can't we can't go through the course with students only making good judgments. That would assume they were really good in the first place. And if they're that good about making judgments in the first place, then they'd probably be teaching the course and not enrolling in it. So I think what we need to do is do we need to kind of work out what is it, what is really core, cool, what is really central, what is really necessary that students need to build over time. 
and they need to build up in their assignments. So let's have some activities early on that involve peer review. But peer review is a process on the way to, for students developing their work to make it better. And the other thing that students need to know is that when they're judging each other, you're not you're you're not accepting what they say. When we get feedback information from a peer, the first thing we do is not to look at the information, but to ask ourselves, is this trustworthy information that I'm going to get? Because there are some people you trust to give you the good oil, and some people you don't trust to give the good oil. There are other people that you're not quite sure about, you want to hear what they have to say. And being able to make good judgments is also a matter of learning how to make judgments about other people. And one of the things I've learned through my career in academic writing is that people that you think are going to be the best people to give you comments on your work are not the ones you think it is. So you don't go with the with, with the the colleague that's got the most expertise. You've got the colleague that actually gives you the most insightful comments. And that might be someone that might be someone who never actually publishes themselves much at all. So we've actually got to learn in when we make judgments to make judgments about uh, trustworthiness and value and what comments we take on and what comments we reject. Because the whole point about getting information from other people is that it's never going to be perfect. So a part of becoming a more sophisticated learner is to make these discriminations, these discernments between the information we're getting. Thank you very much for that, David. While he was speaking, of course, we were um, the chat was going in terms of creating conducive learning spaces for for students actually to to share their misconceptions and learn from them. But then I think an important question from Marion McKay um, in the chat um, is in terms of in, or what she shares in her classes, there seems to be a positive feedback loop between confidence and the willingness to engage in discussion evaluation. Unfortunately, some students just seem to lack the confidence to give any kind of opinion about anything and stay silent. And how does one get around this? I mean, how does one actually create this conducive environment and draw all students out to take part in this? Because I do think it's a it's a very valid concern. Yeah, yeah. Um, that Graham Gibbs exercise I mentioned is one way of doing that. Um, but it was also something I do in my own teaching, which was one of the slides that I skipped over. Um, and, and what I do there is that we go through uh, what you call a, a nominal group process in which the students know what the assignment is. So I pose the question to the students, what would a really good one look like? And then I go around the class and every every person has to answer. Now, some people might find that very threatening, but I think it is a necessary part of being a teacher is to kind of uh, make it quite clear that we value everyone's contribution. And a lot of the people that are very quiet, that don't normally say things, offer really insightful thoughts. So we go around. You don't you can't miss a turn until, you know, there's an awful, awful lot of things already on the board. Um, the other thing which I think is important in, in terms of breaking the ice is that we need to do a huge amount of things in the beginning of first year, in the early first year classes, to completely legitimise speaking up, talking, speaking in front of other people, that, that unless we actually develop student skills in that early on, we're crippling them. We're crippling them as learners um, for the whole rest of their course. So yes, we often find this. We we we're teaching a later course, and we find students very quiet. But I want to want to put the really hard word on everyone teaching first year courses. If you're not developing students' capacity to speak up and contribute and do the kind of things we're talking about here in first year, you've failed. Doesn't matter what else they've learned. That you need to equip them as effective, agentic learners that can contribute to other people contribute for themselves. Of course, there might be the rare individual that has some serious um, problem that means that it, you know, we, we do need to respect their 
uh, need to be silent on some things. But by and large, that is a very, very small minority. And most of the people that are silent in our classes are silent because we have not given the opportunity to join in. Thank you so much for that, David. And I also think sometimes it's it's easier for some students to actually respond in a digital environment where they've got more time to consider and maybe type their contribution than actually yeah. physically getting up in class or putting up their hand and physically speaking. I think a lot of people are really intimidated to do that. And they might rather, if you put up a forum or as you suggested, you know, be much more willing to once they've considered what they want to write and what they want to contribute, actually contribute. Um, yeah, I see lots absolutely. of... of we, found, we found that with our overseas students in particular, they're much more active in contributing to tutorials when they're asynchronous and online. Absolutely. I see agentic learners watch phrase for the new year. Um, March talking about working towards creating evaluative judgment in chemistry 214, working together with Gareth Arnaud. Um, the peer assessment is monitored in different ways. We are giving talks on these after tea. So there is a plug, colleagues, if you want to go and listen to Marge and Gareth after tea time. Um, just looking for any other comments. Uh, yes, um, Ms. Matong saying some LMS learning management tools allows for anonymous feedback for shy students, also bringing in the technology. Colleagues, I'm just watching the time. We've got about four more minutes um, with Professor Baud. Um, uh, thanks, Dave. David, for also being willing to share your presentation with all these wonderful resources with us, as well as the websites that you shared. So I've already getting WhatsApps as well from people saying this has been invaluable, unmissable talks. So um, thank you so much for your contribution. I'm just watching the chat and the hands going up potentially. Colleagues, any other burning issues, questions that you wanted to ask? Um, Antoinette. Go ahead. There was a question earlier on in the chat from Professor Maureen Robinson. Yes, I saw that one. So if learning outcomes are central in this process, are there criteria for good learning outcomes? For example, too vague, too narrow, etc. That is from uh, Professor Maureen Robinson for you, David. I don't know if you want to respond to that. Yes, yes, yes. The, the answer is yes. Um, they can be both too vague and they can be too specific. The, the, there is an art to writing good learning outcomes. In many, many years ago, we had we there was an obsession with learning uh, objectives and there was an obsession with behavioural objectives. And when you wrote them out behaviourally, you had pages and pages and pages. You had whole manuals of these things for just one little subject. Now, that's not what we do now. So typically in our in our context, we are looking at between three and five learning outcomes for a subject. Now, that means you've got to think really, really hard and rigorously about what are those central things that we judge students on. And we are accountable in our system. I don't know what it's like with you, but if we state a learning outcome, we are accountable for assuring it so that we've got to make a judgment of the student. Have they met this learning outcome at this threshold level? because if they haven't made it at the threshold level, they can't progress, so they've failed. So we need to think about these learning outcomes very carefully. And, and, and good learning outcomes, you need few, but of really, really high quality. You need to have kicked them around a long time. What we found was that it needed at least three big iterations over many, many years to get them into a good state. Brilliant, thank you for that, David. Yeah. And then maybe just the last minute, there was a very um, productive and healthy debate yesterday during the keynote panel in the chat between a mathematician and a chemist um, about rote learning. So we would love to hear, um, Zirap asks, um, your opinion on rote learning in connection with yesterday's debate. So the issue was whether it should or not. And I think one point was you need to know three times five is 15. So there's some basic principles in chemistry, mathematics that you just need to know. And yeah, we would love to hear your opinion on that, um, rote learning or not. Well, I, I, sh I should start by a confession. As a child, I never learnt my times tables. <laughs> right. 
I could never recite my times tables. I went on to do a physics degree and I specialised in theoretical physics, which is almost completely mathematical. <laughs> so I, I'm very, very sceptical about people that say there is rote learn there is a lot of rote learning. That said, I agree there is, there is, there is rote learning. But what we need uh, to think about is where should we be assessing it? And if we're assessing it summatively early on, we're actually not doing summative assessment very well. Students need to maybe have learned some things at rote in order for them to do some more sophisticated things. We need to make judgments about those sophisticated things they can do using what they've learned by rote. Students need to learn that they need to do some rote learning in order to get there. But we are not judging them on their memorization of this rote information. What we're judging them on is can they apply this in a meaningful and sensible way in order to solve really important issues in the discipline? So rote learning is a transitional process. It is not the ultimate in any form of assessment, in my view. Thank you very much for that answer, um, David. And I see Prof. Renal Dupriya also mentioned in the chat, assess rote learning during formative assessment application in summative. So, so that, um, so, and wonderful. You've solved the debate, um, Zurab. <laughs> <laughs> the mathematics professor said you've solved it. So, um, yes, I remember my mum did not want me to go to school one morning and I loved going to school until she, I could demonstrate that I knew all my tables up to the 12 times tables. <laughs> so that got me learning my tables. Oh, 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 we, should, we shouldn't harass our kids for doing this. Not, A six-year-old kid, yeah, it was close to you what do you call it, um, yeah, harassment and child, um, but anyway. So um, in conclusion, uh, David, uh, thank you so much for an absolutely insightful, theorized, but also very, very, very practical keynote. I think you can see from the clapping coming through again, all the comments. Um, this has been a debate going on since yesterday. Uh, the, the things that you've mentioned also aligns very closely. We've got a brand new assessment policy that we are um, implementing from next year. And one of the underpinnings of that assessment policy is assessment as a conversation. So this has been such a timely talk and um, so spot on for our um, a conversation that's ongoing currently at Stellenbosch University. So with huge thanks to you um, for spending some time with us today, leaving your resources in, in terms of the presentation as all and all the references. And yeah, don't be surprised if you might be um, invited back soon <laughs> for a follow up session with us as well. Thank you very much, Professor Bart. Really appreciate yeah. it. Well, thank you very much, Antoinette, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your conference. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Bard. Colleagues, it's now tea time until 10.